Let's review the most important terms and definitions. There are quite a few, so I'm going to go through them carefully and hopefully you can stay with me to make sure you understand each of these key terms. The first one, LTV, which stands for loan to value. This is the amount that you can borrow against the market value of a property or a building. So for example, when you go to get a mortgage on your house, the LTV may be 80%. You can borrow up to 80% of the value of the house. Then there's LTC, which stands for loan to cost. It's a little bit different. This is the amount of debt financing you can get as a percent of the development cost. So the difference here obviously is that in loan to value, the value is already known and it exists. In loan to cost, it's something that you're going to create that does not exist yet. And therefore, it's going to be a lower percentage, let's say 70% as this example. NOI, this stands for net operating income. This is a very important metric in real estate rental properties and in development. To calculate the net operating income, you take the gross rental revenue, then you deduct your operating expenses, which will include property taxes, insurance, repairs and maintenance, as well as capital expenditures. What's left at the end is your net operating income. The cap rate is a very commonly used term in real estate development and in the real estate industry. It represents the valuation of a property. So to calculate the cap rate, you take the net operating income and you divide it by the value of the property and we express that as a percent. So for example, the cap rate on this building is 4.5%. Another way to think of the cap rate is like the yield. If you think of what the yield on a dividend paying stock is, for example, 5%, you can kind of think of cap rate in the same way. And of course, price and yield are inversely correlated. So the higher the yield, or the higher the cap rate, the lower the value of the property. A very low cap rate property indicates that it's extremely highly valued. Amortization period. This is the number of months or years or periods that the principal repayments take to be completed. So, for example, a 30-year mortgage is a 30-year amortization period. Term. Term is slightly different than amortization period. It's the length of time that the interest rate on the mortgage is agreed for. So you may have a 30-year amortization period for your mortgage, but just a 5-year term on the interest rate agreement. That means in 5 years, you're going to have a different rate when it resets. Many real estate development deals are structured as partnerships, where you have a GP, which is a general partner. They own part of the partnership, but they take on all of the responsibility in terms of unlimited reliability, and they usually manage the actual development. The other side of the partnership is the LP, or limited partner, who is a passive investor and is just putting money into this project, but not any sweat equity, not any time, and not any liability beyond what they've invested. Many real estate development deals are also structured as corporations, so it's important to know whether you're structuring as a GPLP or as a corporation. A land loan is a type of financing that's used to acquire a piece of land. It's a piece of land that does not have any operating income or NOI. So the loan to value is going to be much lower than with an income producing property. So a land loan, let's say, as a rule of thumb, might be 50%. FSR is a very common term in real estate development and it stands for floor space ratio and it's used to determine what the size of the building and the density can be in a parcel of land. So for example, uh, cities or municipalities will actually set regulations around FSRs as a way of controlling density in the area. GBA stands for Gross Building Area. This is the sum of all the building spaces from wall to wall. It also includes some parts of the building that are not saleable, which will be covered in the next term. Next, we've got GLA, which stands for Gross Leasable Area. This is the enclosed livable space and is different than the building area because it excludes certain things like patios or garages or parking stalls, 
unlivable spaces essentially are excluded. We've also got the gross site area. This is the dimensions of the actual site itself in 2D of the actual ground, so it's based on property lines. The gross site area essentially tells you from property line to property line how big the plot is. The gross site area, however, often includes some sections of land that can't be developed. These are known as deductions, so it could be, for example, a public access road or lane. This is something that cuts through the property, but that you can't build over. So when you take the gross site area and you subtract any deductions that can't be built, then you get the net site area. So this is the actual area of the site that can be built upon. Next up, we have the max GBA. This is the gross building area and the maximum amount that could possibly be built based on the floor space ratio that's been assigned to the property. That does not mean that's how big the building is going to be, it just means that's how big it could be if it were developed to its maximum capacity. So then, once you know the max GBA, you've got the construction buildable area. And this is the gross buildable area based on construction plans, which, as I said before, may not maximize the total amount. And then finally, you've got the saleable area. This is the GBA based on construction, less any common spaces or non-saleable areas, such as hallways and corridors or other common areas. Let's look at the most common joint venture structure for real estate development projects. It typically consists of a general partner and a limited partner, or a group of limited partners. The general partner, or GP, is the one who's leading the charge. They're responsible for management decisions. They're overseeing this real estate development project. They are typically the firm or the party that's behind the deal. They have a duty to act in the best interests of their investors. They are also liable for their actions, and they may have to put up personal guarantees as security to borrow to fund the transaction. So you can think of the general partners as the managers behind the transaction. Then the limited partners, the investors. The limited partners are called that because they have a limited liability. They can only lose the capital that they've put into the project. They would have a liquidation preference typically ahead of the general partners. What they really bring to the table is a much larger sum of capital than the general partners to fund the transaction. They have no control over day-to-day decision-making in the project and are simply along for the investment returns.